And the Buddha identified the cause of suffering. He didn't define it as a blanket craving for things to be different from what they are. After all, the desire to develop skillful qualities, the desire to prevent unskillful qualities from arising, the desire to get rid of unskillful qualities that are there, those are good desires. Those are actually part of the path. Now the Buddha identified three specific kinds of craving that he said lead to further becoming. Now the term further becoming can refer to new states of becoming in your mind. You should go from one to the next to the next. But it's also his word for rebirth. Remember that image he had of how when you're reborn, it's like a house of fire. And the flame goes out from the house, carried by the wind, to another house. The wind there is the craving. The fire clings to the wind, and the mind clings to the craving. That's what carries you on. It might sound good that you can go where you crave to go, but craving, like wind, can go in some pretty strange places. Think about what it's going to be like when you die. You find that you can't stay in this body. And there's going to be a fear that you're going to leave your sensual pleasures. And so the mind latches onto any sensual idea that can come its way. That's dangerous because you can latch onto all kinds of sensuality. There's deva sensuality, of course, but there's also human sensuality. There's animal sensuality. And who knows where you're going to go if you don't have any control over your mind. This craving for becoming. And you feel that you're going to lose your identity. And you want to find a new identity. Again, if you're really desperate, you'll latch on to anything. And this craving for non-becoming. Say you're in a lot of pain when you die. There's a lot of mental anguish from leaving your family, leaving your loved ones. And all you can think about is how you'd like to have everything just snuffed out. You would rather be obliterated than continue in that suffering. That can take you to some pretty strange places, too. There's a state that's called the state of non-perception, where you totally blank out. You can stay blanked out for quite a while. Then you come out. And that's when Taya Chan said to you, bum bum bur bur, you, you don't have all your wits about you. Because the mind has been suppressed for so long. So even though craving is what takes you, it's not necessarily the case that you will go to places that you would really want to go. Because on top of that, there's fear. The Buddha lists four kinds of fear. There's fear of losing sensuality. There's fear of losing your body. There's fear of punishment. You think about the unskillful things you've done, and a lot of times these things will come to the mind. As you're dying, you suddenly realize that Things you did a long time ago could leave you open to punishment. It's a scary idea. And then finally, there's the fear that comes as what the Buddha describes as not knowing the true Dharma. In other words, you don't really know what's going to happen after you die. You, will you be annihilated? Will you be forced to go someplace you don't want to go? Where are you going to go? You really don't know. There's that big blank, facing it. That can be scary, too. Of course, it's scary because of your craving. Fear of losing sensuality, of course, is related to craving for sensuality. Fear of losing the body is related both to sensuality and craving for becoming, in the sense that your body is a large part of your sense of yourself. 
and afraid that you're going to lose your means for finding the pleasures of sensuality. Fear of punishment is also related to craving for sensuality. You crave pleasure, but you're afraid you're going to end up with pain. You're going to be taken to a, a realm that you don't want to go. So this craving for becoming is also involved. As for the fear that comes from not knowing the Dharma, that affects all the three forms of craving. You may want to be annihilated, but you may not be. You may want to be reborn, but you're afraid you have no idea what's going to go on. So all these forms of fear that come from the fact that you don't know if your cravings are going to be satisfied or not. You feel powerless in the face of death. You realize how little you can control. The Johns talk about how sudden and unexpected death can be, and how disorienting it can be. And John Cha compares it to sitting there, and all of a sudden someone comes up with a big burlap sack and puts it over your head, puts it over your body, carries you off, throws you out someplace else, totally beyond your control. So you have to work on these cravings and substitute them with the desires of the path. And this is where another form of fear comes in. Actually, it's a kind of fear that's actually useful, and the Buddha recommends it. It's called compunction. That sense that your actions really do matter, and you've got to be very careful about what you say and do. And compunction is very closely related to heedfulness. And the Buddha often ties it with ardency. So it's the fear that motivates right effort. And this is a fear that comes with a sense of power. In other words, you realize you do have the ability to make a difference through your actions. So you want to make the best use of that power, because you know that if you misuse it, there's going to be trouble. So you try to develop the skillful qualities that will help protect you against those four kinds of fear. For example, fear of losing out on the sensual pleasures you had. The Buddha says you can't really pry yourself loose of sensual pleasures until you find a pleasure that is not related to sensuality. And these are the pleasures of concentration. Let's just sit here, focus on the breath. You can get the breath really comfortable as you explore how the breathing process feels in the body. That feeling of comfort, even though it's very intense, is not counted as a sensual pleasure. Even though it's related to the body, it's not counted as a sensual pleasure. It's a pleasure of form. The body as it relates to the elements of earth, water, wind, and fire inside. In other words, the solidity, the coolness, warmth, energy. You can work with these things and get them balanced in a way that feels gratifying. This can help pry you loose of your attachment to sensuality. As for your attachment to the body, this is why we have contemplation of the body. You can imagine taking a part in your mind, you know, all those different parts, and you put them on the floor in front of you. you ask yourself, okay, which one do you want to identify with? Which one are you afraid of losing? At the same time, you want to develop your concentration. So you can get to some of the formless realms when the breath settles down. There's a sense of fullness of breath energy in the body. Everything is balanced. You'll have a sense that the boundary of the body begins to disappear. You have a sense that the body is like a mist of body sensations. And you realize that between the dots of the mist, there's space. And if your concentration and mindfulness is strong enough, you can focus on the perception of space. And you can realize that you don't have to keep focusing on the body. 
the body was there. And if you want to create a sensation of the body again out of the, those dots of sensation, you can do that. But you have the choice of going for the space. It helps to weaken your attachment to the body. As for fear of punishment, the Buddha reminds you that you may have done things bad in the past. But that doesn't mean you have to go to a bad destination. You start doing good things in the meantime and develop a right view. That can take you in a good direction. You recognize a mistake for the mistake it was, and then you develop thoughts of goodwill to all beings. That helps to strengthen your right view and your resolve not to do anything harmful again. And it can provide a really good dwelling place for the mind. As you face death with no ill will for anyone. Finally, the fear that comes from not knowing the true Dharma. This is resolved only at stream entering. When you finally realize that the Buddha was right, there is a deathless element that can be attained through human effort. But you can work in the direction of overcoming that fear. by paying very careful attention to the qualities of your mind. And this is where the practice of compunction and heedfulness comes in. As you work on developing skillful qualities, you realize that they really do have a good impact. As you let go of unskillful qualities, it does have a good impact. The mind in the present moment is a lot more free. And the impact of that change ripples out in your life. So you get more and more confident that the Buddha was right about this. So maybe he's right about rebirth. Maybe he's right about the effects of karma over the long term. This doesn't totally resolve your doubts, but it moves you in the right direction. So try to replace fear of death with fear of being unskillful. I heard somebody the other night talk about how if you strive and strive and strive in your practice, it creates unskillful qualities in the mind, strong sense of self. So you just let things ride as they are. Whatever skillful or unskillful comes up, you just be okay with it. Well, that attitude doesn't take you anywhere at all. It doesn't take you anywhere new, at least. If you really want to overcome your sense of self, you dedicate yourself to developing skillful qualities. No matter what you think, no matter what you might like to do, you tell yourself, I'm just going to do what's skillful, abandon what's unskillful. And that way you overcome your laziness, you overcome your, your preferences for doing just what you like right here, right now, as you think about the long term. And that way your unskillful senses of self get trained, brought back into line. And it's a lot easier to let go of a skillful sense of self than it is one that's up and down and skillful sometimes, unskillful other times, one that's lazy. So don't be afraid of developing a, too much of a sense of self around the activity of striving in your meditation. It's the striving that sorts out through your senses of self. So you can hold on to the good ones. That's what the practice of compunction, the practice of heedfulness can do for you. So you can approach death with a lot less fear, with a lot more control over your cravings, control over your fears. So you don't succumb. Instead you come out victorious. I had a friend back in high school who said she was hoping that at her obituary they didn't say that she had succumbed. It sounds like you're defeated.
You want to come out winning. The ideal victory, of course, is not coming back at all. But failing that, if you have some control over your cravings, like the image in the Dhammapada, the, the person who can control the chariot, the wild horses of your mind, is the person who can exert control over the mind. That's the true charioteer. Other people just hold the reins. In other words, the horses can go wherever they want to go. But you want your horses to take you to place. You'd be happy to go. This is one of the reasons why we meditate. To get some control over the wild horses of the mind and get them to be tamed.